Hello, I'm Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor specializing in the Boreal Forest. We are now in a kind of a for forest that is found right at the base of the mountains. Today's topic is what we might, or what I might term, a survival knife. Now I define it very quickly as the term a survival knife is a pry bar that works wood really, really well. For example, I feel that what you call a survival knife, if it doesn't carve a netting needle and a shuttle in, let's say, five minutes that uh, looks something like this, I would question its usefulness as a basic tool in doing the things you have to do in survival. The other things that uh, call upon its effectiveness as a pry bar, and the reason I say pry bar is that it's got to be strong enough to endure a lot of abuse. As you might see, we'll define that as we go along. Now, a lot of this information is found in the literature and other aspects of our videos that Karamat uh, puts out. Uh, here we have a book that discusses knives for a few pages anyway, and the tools of survival and survival training. I have a chapter on knives in bushcraft, which uh, a lot of people have commented it's one of the rare knives, rare, rare books in the area of wilderness skills that does devote at least a chapter to the use of this very important tool. Now, the situation with regard to the most important application, I would say that likely it's the shaving of wood for two purposes. One purpose is to make kindling. So we mean by shaving that the knife must have the capability of acting like a plane and being able to take very fine, thin, slices of wood off of the, 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 the uh, hopefully a knot free piece of wood until you have enough to be able to light a fire. Usually about a dozen of these. Well that's a very important requirement of a knife and it's not that difficult to uh, get a blade to do this. The next part is in the carving of things. Well you might build multitudinous things in the forest. Replacement paddles. We uh, might uh, uh, have to build buck saws, so pack frames, we have to study the grain in the wood. So if the knife does not leave a smooth uh, slice that uh, doesn't wear your hand out, well then again, and the knife that makes those beautiful curls will make very smooth handles when your ability to use it for making shavings develops so that the need to sand might not even be there because of the, the, the sharpness and the way the knife cuts. So the knife here, which is a Skookum um, Rod Garcia of Whitefish, Montana, makes this knife. The bevel on it is what we call a Scandi bevel. The handle fits well. The blade can range from maybe one and a half fingers to four fingers generally before the knife gets unwieldy. And all the configurations in here make it a knife that will work wood will allow you to skin your moose, will allow you to do a lot of the um, operations that you would like to be able to expedite in, in a survival situation. After shaving, probably the shaving of wood, here we have, for example, an artifact called a ski shoe and it's been peeled. You don't have to peel these in some circumstances because the, you might want more grip in the snow, but if you want this to act more like a ski than a snowshoe, then the smooth sticks help out. And each one of these sticks should be peelable with a knife like this in less than a minute, basically. And here we have a, a little bit of a, of a kind of a gnarly piece of spruce, and we're talking about the operation of being able to remove the bark to lighten the... Um, um, the, the, the ski shoe's construction and to allow it to dry out and become more springy. If the knife won't peel a snowshoe stick in a minute, then we're asking you, why did you bring the knife? What is it supposed to do exactly if it doesn't make shavings and it doesn't shave the wood and clear the bark off? Now another uh, use is to be able to eventually replace at least the hatchet in uh, use of splitting and many other operations. And one is in the use of wedges. Now, if you're carrying a saw around your waist and you make a buck saw, then you'll be able to section wood into various lengths and do various things. Here, we have taken a block of wood <coughs> and we have taken off wedges or uh, slices 
And we find that the more into the wood we go, the further the split will go until the split will end up reaching the whole length of this particular uh, piece of, of, um, of wood. Here we probably want a moderate one, so we put this on and using a bat or a stick, we call this a baton, we can make our split. Here we have enough that we can still reach over. If it's awkward, then we make a, a, a rough uh, wedge and use the wedge to complete the, the split. And we now have a shingle that will be convertible to a wedge. And we have made, pre-made, a number of this to give us more um, um, time to discuss other things. And we will proceed to split a log. Here we'll clean up the wedge a bit because you probably might end up using the wedge for quite some time. The, uh, if the wedges are of different size or length or width, you end up um, having a, a versatility here and being able to do a lot of work. The more wedges you have, the longer you'll be able to use them. Because if you had 20 wedges, the lightest tap will drive the wedge in. If you're using one edge, you have to get pretty violent with it, and that usually destroys the wedge. So if you want to save wedges and, and keep from making them over and over again, we're going to split this log, and we'll avoid these because they make splits easy. If I put wedges in here, one wedge would probably split that very, very easily from that check to that check, and that, of course, isn't displaying what we can do. We'll pick a, a, a place where there is no checks and see where we get. In the use of batons, you should realize that different sizes are going to uh, come into play at some point or another. So we have about three sizes and the person doing a lot of work might have more and some may be even heavier than this. This is getting close to being that of a, of a, of a bat. Now if I take a very heavy wedge and hit lightly, I'm going to be a lot easier on my wedge than taking a small wedge and beating fiercely on it. That's the whole point in having different wedge sizes. <clears throat> Here we are going to make a line. Now some of these wedges can be so good you don't have to do this, but we make a line to start the wedge. And if we're going to go across the log, might as well continue on. We look to see if there's knots because sometimes a knot will be in just the wrong place. We will now take the wedges starting at the biggest. Perhaps this one is so broad that we'll hang it over the edge. And when we hit the wedge with something hard like a knife, we get a musical note, which we might employ uh, to avert boredom in that you can play music on this because basically you've got to spend a little time pounding gently the next biggest wedge. And if we have three or four wedges, they will last the longest. Get it started. And keeping in with the musical tradition. Now when you're splitting something, here's a point which causes many cuts. If I hold my knife like this and bear down to make a split, usually I might have the split occur and the only way the blade is going to stop on the bones of my hand. Otherwise, if I don't want that to happen, I push with my fingers opposite, and as I push, my blade can only go as far as that. That's probably averts a, a great deal of cuts. And since, now here we have something that maybe we want even shorter because we want to be musical today. Well, here we have another application of the baton in that we can go around and weaken the stick to the extent that we can break it easily at the notches. And there we go with three different sizes of wedge. Now you could have them all the same size, but this particular aside, which I am demonstrating here, has amused countless students Now when you're working with a wedge, over here, you've got one tap at the moment. One, 
One, one, start again. Rhythm and music begins to shape up. Now I could split this block eventually by tapping so lightly, but that takes time. So we will revert back and we will choose one of these wedges. Perhaps this one will, will is not extremely heavy. The other one's almost too heavy. And we give it a, a light enough hit that we don't damage the wedges and we can use the wedges for a long time now there is something that's causing resistance. We examine that. Is it a knot or is it just that the wedge is so thin? And here the smaller wedges tend to favor the split, so we favor it. And that one is a lot slower. It could be blunter. And so on until you have created the split. Pick the ones that are going to work the best. And that is something not commonly found is, and we can see that difficulty in splitting maybe is demonstrated by the fact that this is not as regular as it would seem. And this causes us to split off materials to make traps, deadfalls, triggers, more wedges, canoes, and so on. One ploy in the business of knife skills is learning your notches and we have here a stick called a tri-stick and on this are all the various notches that could be employed so you learn terminology and you develop your knife skills uh, through the making of these to prove to the instructor that you are listening and that you are, are uh, actually picking up the, the type of different things you could do with a knife to a lot of these uh, sort of are in traps, deadfalls and snares and folk toys. Some of them are cabin notches. And that's some of the things you learn to do with a knife. If you can bend a tree and cause a bend, you can usually cut it down, which means that even wrist thick trees can be bent if you soften them and bend them back and forth. This is a pretty common thickness. Bend it and cut at the and as you cut and progress, open it more and more and more until the knife goes right on through. And of course, if you want to be, you could make, if you wanted to, you could make that cut in a flash. But this is the standard way of cutting snowshoe sticks, pack frame sticks, uh, you name it. And sometimes you'll even get a wrist thick tree that's eight feet long by this method once you are practiced and skilled. Uh, probably next to uh, uh, shaving, this could be a practical skill where you extract the things from the bushes you need. If you look up the website karamat.com, you will find all the information that we are presenting. Here, for example, we, we have a thing called the Tools of Survival and Survival Training, defining maybe your survival knife. All of this is, uh, to a certain extent, available in booklet form, but you can download it in, in, in regular uh, means of 8.5 by 11. For example, a book on sharpening, information you won't find anywhere else, how to net, how to do just about anything. The, there are over less than 20 titles at the moment, but by this time, by the year 2013, when it comes to an end, there'll probably be 200 different um, so, uh, uh, bits of information where you essentially can buy this uh, stuff chapter at a time rather than a whole book at a time, pick and choose. There is, uh, I've written a book called Bushcraft, and it's available through Karamat, and we uh, uh, have many videos and, and DVDs concerning plants and, and techniques. There is some on fire and shelters, on uh, the uh, skillful use of, of the knife, sharpening, knots, and so on.